Ooh, well, welcome to the Heavy Spoiler Show. I'm your host, Definition, aka the guy living his best life in the worst timeline, and this video we're breaking down the finale of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I just want to get into the breakdown as there's a lot of things to talk about, but obviously there will be heavy spoilers here, so if you don't want anything ruined, then I recommend that you turn off now. Anyway, with all that out of the way, this is the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Definition. Now let's get into the ending of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Okay, so before tackling the mammoth finale, we need to discuss how time travel actually works in the show so that things don't get too complicated the further into the breakdown we get. Throughout the show's ending, we discover that the seventh season has operated in its own timeline, which we discover fractured off from the main one which was connected to the MCU. An alternate reality has of course been teased by things like the death of Mac and Daisy's parents. However, the finale actually uses this alternate version of events to tie into Fitz's plan. Initially, Deke stated that they might be operating with the time stream theory, which suggested that if they screwed up the timeline too much, that time itself would collapse. This is why early on they avoided killing Malik and really messing anything up. However, the longer things ended up going on, the more messed up they became, and it turned out that an alternate timeline had actually been created. So the group jumped back in time, and then after making changes, continued on a parallel timeline set off by the butterfly effect that they created all the way back in episode 1. We learn that Fitz and Simmons stole a piece of Chronicom tech all the way back in season 6, and with this, the former has been monitoring the timeline, using the knowledge gained from it to create a certain pathway. Fitz has basically been an opposite to Sybil, and after viewing the entire time stream, he realised that the only way to stop the Chronicoms was to save Daisy's sister Cora. In the original timeline, she'd killed herself, and thus Fitz's plan this entire time was to create a timeline in which this would not happen and Cora would become their ally, enabling them to defeat the machines once and for all. That's a basic bird's eye view of everything, but we'll discuss it the further we get into the video. Now episode 12 opens with Mac, Daisy and Sousa where we left them last time. The group are adrift in space, making their way to the Zephyr. Though they manage to dock, the Zephyr itself is pulled into the Chronicom ship using their tractor beam, which of course pulls them in too. Eventually they board the Zephyr and find it empty, much to their surprise. It turns out that Malik's forces have left, and all that remains is the guy who used the word sir last week. Which, what a, what a bloody scumbag. Now, we join Malik walking down a hallway that actually looks like something out of the opening of The Phantom Menace. Malik says to Simmons and Deke that they have one last chance to hand over Fitz's location, but neither budge, and because of this, they're thrown in a cell. It's at this point we come face to face with Sybil, in the flesh, well, sort of, but since being destroyed by Coulson, she's managed to rebuild her body much like he did. They discuss the shield bases being destroyed, and now all that remains is the lighthouse. This is because, due to the way that it was built, it can withstand any major attack from the outside. I don't know why they can't just blast it from space, but yeah, apparently they can't. Now Sybil has also given Simmons an injection that can completely dissolve her implant, and thus she will find out soon enough where Fitz is. However, we discover that this is backfiring, and that her memories are dissolving completely, along with who Fitz is. Deke also does a hilariously bad impression of Fitz, but Simmons still can't remember the men she laughs. That, that was that was probably as good as Deke's impression. Now it's at this point that Cora confronts Malik over the killing of her mother. He tells her about how much her mother hated her and lies about her wanting to exterminate her. The conversation ends with him promising to bury all those that tried to hurt Cora next to Jia Ying, and though not outright stated, this is clearly hinting to her that Daisy the person carrying Jai Ying's legacy will try and do the same thing to Korra. We then jump with Garrett to the lighthouse and he places a chronobomb on the wall. Later in the episode, May notices Garrett doing this throughout the entire complex and they end up using a device that can stop him from teleporting in order to shut down his plan. This is actually a callback to when Coulson lost his hand many, many seasons ago. In that entry, they'd managed to stop Gordon in the base and Coulson caught the Terrigen Mist crystal that he was carrying. This started the inhuman transformation process on him, but Mac managed to sever his hand with an axe before things took hold. It's through this device that they defeat Garrett, and we actually get a nice flip on his death, which I'll discuss in just a bit. Now on board the Chronicom ship, Daisy gives Sousa a kiss and begins sneaking around, which is when she catches the attention of Sybil. 
Sybil admits that she hasn't been able to predict their actions. However, she brushes this to the side and says it's purely because they're meaningless. So it looks like Daisy was right in a belief that Sybil wouldn't be able to predict her abandoning Cora, and this does play into how their plan actually comes to fruition. Sybil believes that letting Daisy reunite with Simmons will increase the probability of them discovering Fitz's location, and thus she makes Malik stay his hand. This allows Daisy to sneak through the base, which is why the Chronicoms later pass her in the corridor. Malik and Cora decide to go against this though, and it's at this point I remembered who Malik reminded me of. Evan Peters, he's, I tell you what, he's bloody just like Evan Peters. Now at the lighthouse, Colson and May predict the point that Garrett will arrive at due to it being a key structural location. He does this and they manage to trap him by using handcuffs that stop him from teleporting. Colson orders him to stop the attack and he calls Malik who basically says no. It turns out Malik is willing to sacrifice his new best bud and he detonates all of the explosives at the location. Luckily, Yo-Yo manages to get them all to one location before they go off, which means that they don't completely destroy the base. Through the rubble, the team dig their way out and find Garrett, who they decide to save. This convinces him that the timeline he was shown was incorrect and that S.H.I.E.L.D. aren't actually that bad. It turns out that Colton actually used himself to S.H.I.E.L.D. May, and though the pair don't get the happy ending together, it's nice to see that they do still care about one another. At the Zephyr, the Chronicoms arrive to kill Mac and Sousa, but the pair have other plans. They actually end up using the self-destruct function of the Chronicoms, which is a callback to earlier in the season at the Area 51 facility. One of the Chronicoms plan to use themselves as a weapon in order to destroy Helios, and the two turn the tables on their enemy by using this function against them. I actually love the interactions between Sousa and Mac in this episode, and the latter becomes kind of like an approving father throughout the entry. We watch as Daisy gets to Simmons, who doesn't recognise her. However, she decides to trust her after she promises her a costume. They make their way back to the Zephyr, which is where Simmons' memories start to return as the implant begins to dissolve. It's at this point that Cora arrives to stop them, and Daisy convinces her to do the right thing and join their side. The pair realise that they should actually join forces, much like how they should have done with their mother in their respective timelines. Division between Jaya Ying and her daughters never really led to a good outcome, and thus they're putting their differences aside in order to do the right thing. Back at the lighthouse, Colson has picked up a pattern in the strange signals, which he realises is the location of an 084. This has actually appeared in the series quite a lot, and it actually means an object of unknown origin. They decide to let Garrett free in order to help them, and on board the Chronicom ship, Malik comes across Cora, who's had a change of heart. He stuns her and sends her to a cell, whilst the team get to the Zephyr and fly out of the hangar. Using the Chronicom bodies strapped to a missile, they manage to escape, and I love how they kind of look like crash test dummies as they went bobbing along to their death. Now it's here that we jump to the speakeasy that we've seen dotted throughout the season. This becomes a key location in this entry, and it's nice to see it pop up throughout the entire series. A cool little easter egg also appears here, as we see Garrett shot by a young Victoria Hand. This is actually a flip on the original timeline, as in that it was Garrett that shot Hand in episode 17 of the first season. Here they meet Agent Brandon Gamble, who it turns out received a package from his grandfather who was in the SSR. He and others were told to protect these 084s at all cost, and they've waited their entire lives for this moment. At this moment, an old man shows up, stating that he received the final piece from either Enoch or the Koenigs. Enoch and Koenig of course worked in the same speakeasy together at one point, and we learn that the pair deposited the pieces to build this machine throughout time to specific people. Using this last piece they open a passage, in which a portal similar to the Quantum Realm machine from Endgame can be seen. With her wedding ring as the last part of the puzzle, Fitz is pulled through the Quantum Realm, donning the same helmet that Deke wore when he first entered the show. Not gonna lie, I was very happy to see Fitz back, even if it feels like it's been ages since we last saw him. Now this was obviously the same method that they used in Avengers Endgame, and it looks like Fitz and Simmons have managed to create the Morbius Strip GPS system that Stark did in the film. We jump immediately into the next episode, and discover that Fitz has been in the original timeline, controlling the events, and hoping that the team make it to this point with Korra. Fitz just wants to grab her and jump back, but Coulson says they can't just leave this timeline to the fate of the Chronicoms. They hatch a plan to take the Chronicoms with them to their timeline, but in order to do this, someone has to stay behind. 
Sousa initially volunteers to do it, but Deke, in the end, Deke puts himself forward. I'm not, I'm not crying. Now, what I liked about this is that Deke is actually from an alternate timeline himself. So him being taken from one timeline and then put into this new one does make a lot of sense for the character. Guy's probably going to have a pretty good life ripping off Don't You Forget About Me and hopefully Michael Jackson. I'd love to see him do Smooth Criminal. Now, Deke promises that they might see him again as he's Fitzsimmons' his grandchild and together they put their plan in motion to pull the Chronicoms back. The other S.H.I.E.L.D. agents look to Deke for their new director and he actually becomes that, a sort of Nick Fury in their world. Hopefully he gets an eye patch as well and he can become the white Nick Fury from the comics as I'd absolutely love that and in my head, that's now the canon. Now on the Zephyr, Fitz pulls Simmons' memory back through the use of a story which reconnects her to them. Fitz reminds Gemma of a childhood in which she used to stargaze with her father. Through the use of her favourite star Alia, Fitz pulls her back through and we see what happened to the pair in season 6. This is when Enoch rescued them and I also love how we get to see his, his eye robot skin at one point. With his own copy of the time stream, he's monitored what they needed to do in order to stop the Chronicom War that's currently about to ravage the planet. After meeting with Piper and Flint, they formed a plan and together the trio travelled to a distant solar system in order to build a time machine. Here they spent years putting everything together and they actually carved out a life for themselves and had a daughter named Alia. Fitz worked on the time machine, using himself to view the time stream but the radiation decayed his brain slightly and thus he couldn't handle the Diana implant which is why Simmons ended up taking it and travelling with the agents. So last week when they were discussing the bloodworks, this was actually in reference to the bloodworks that doctors tend to take when someone is pregnant. So though we probably got 80% of our theories wrong, we got the one about their daughter right. We did it. It wasn't all for nothing. But yeah, we do kind of suck. Now on board the Zephyr, Malik gets angry that Sybil's plan is beginning to fail and he goes to Cora's cell, demanding they strap her up to the power sucking machine. The group split up and one team goes to the temple from the season 6 finale. They don hazmat suits so that no one can see their faces and we watch as certain events from the ending of season 6 play out but from the perspective of the older versions of the characters. This shows May getting escorted to the healing chamber and Yo-Yo recovering from the Shrike attack. It turns out that the people in hazmat suits at the end of season 6 were actually this group and huge props to the creative team for planning this all out in advance. If they'd seen the other versions of themselves then they would have created an alternate timeline and thus things remain unchanged because of these suits so yeah, no paradox and we don't have to worry about any branch realities. From space, the Chronicom sends the original Zephyr moving whilst the future one hangs there waiting for them to attack. The past one of course travels with Enoch, Simmons and Fitz to Alia and the one that's just been through season 7 boards the Chronicom ship so nice little pulling of everything together here. On the ship, Daisy takes down the Hunters whilst Mac and Coulson make their way through it. They're ambushed by more of the Chronicom forces and Daisy takes on Malik. There's a lot of slow motion flying about but but you know what, it's quite a good climax to end on. Mac comes across Cora and saves her from the machine while Sybil almost, almost busts out a supervillain monologue. Coulson stops her dead in her tracks though and tells her that the shield forces are at the lighthouse. She enters her authorization into the command panel in order to send the forces there and May arrives and busts up the hunters with Coulson. Weirdly, Sybil is actually dispatched really quickly and for the big bad of the season, I thought she went out pretty unceremoniously with very little of a fight. At this point, the Chronicom forces move towards the lighthouse and Simmons' memories come flooding back of her daughter. On the main ship, May plugs herself into the command kiosk and through Cora, she passes on empathy to the Chronicoms, which ultimately disables them. Now, I've seen a lot of people confused over what exactly is going on here, but basically, it boils down to this. Through Enoch, Fitz and co realize that the Chronicoms could learn empathy, and thus, if they had this, they would side with the humans. Enoch and Fitz's friendship was a shining example of how the two can coexist, and thus, this became part of Fitz's plan. Thus, May was able to absorb emotions through her empathetic abilities throughout the season and pass them onto the machines who'd all journey to the lighthouse under Sybil's orders. On board the Chronicom ship, Malik tells Daisy that there's no way to kill him without killing herself and she says that's the idea. 
She sets off a quake that destroys all of the Chronicom ships, and thus they're defeated. Daisy floats through space, doing the blue thing that they do in the MCU, as she slowly starts to freeze. Korra, using the powers which she tried to drop on Jia Ying, is able to bring Daisy back from Death's door, and down on Earth, Fitzsimmons travels to Piper and Flint, who are not only guarding the time machine, but also their daughter. Now, there are some little monkey toys in the corner, and this is a play on the running joke that Fitz always talks about monkeys. From pretty much the first season up to now, he's dropped the animal at several points, so it's good to see that, like father, like daughter. We see a montage of them raising her, and she would of course go on to become Deke's mother. We then get a big time jump of one year, and the group meet back up at the speakeasy. Throughout S.H.I.E.L.D.'s history, bars have been the place where the agents have said their goodbyes to one another, and there's been several scenes where they've raised a glass to the departing members. The group meet up and share the stories of their new jobs, and it's a really emotional scene. It turns out that Fitzsimmons have raised their child together, Susie is still a thing, and May has a brand new job as a lecturer at S.H.I.E.L.D. Mac enters looking like Nick Fury, and he's continued as the director on assignment. Yo-Yo is working with Piper, and everyone seems a lot, lot happier. Colton has a lot of things he wants to do, and we learn that he's been traveling the world by himself, actually getting some time away from the job. Now at this point, I just wanna give a huge shout out to Clark Gregg, and it's crazy to think that he started with the MCU all the way back in 2008's Iron Man, and I doubt that anyone else will ever have as many appearances as he had in Marvel properties for a long, long time. Colson gets offered numerous jobs and positions, but politely, he turns them down. It's at this point that we realize they aren't actually in the room and they've just sent holograms to meet once more. Slowly they blink out after saying their goodbyes and they realize at one point, pretty much all of them had died and you know what, it was a really fun way to close off the season. Yo-Yo goes first, showing that she's in a car with Piper and an LMD Davis. It's at this point that you start getting goosebumps and May appears with Flint at the Colson Academy, which is of course dedicated to the character. Fitz and Simmons return to their picnic with Alia. <laughs> I'm not crying, you're crying. Mac explains that he's left a package for Colson, which will open with the code 136. This is a little nod to the series as a whole, as this is the 136th episode of S.H.I.E.L.D. Mac returns to being Mac Fury on a heli carrier, floating through the sky, leaving just Colson and Daisy to say their goodbyes. The two have some really emotional parting words, and it's the perfect way to end this series in my opinion. Colson disappears, and then Daisy pulls out to reveal that she's on board the Zephyr with Sousa and Cora. Together, they're conducting missions throughout space, and it is possible that they will create Agents of Sword. On the set of WandaVision, Sword was spotted as one of the signs, and it is likely that the MCU could be moving off in this direction with Daisy leading the charge. Chloe Bennett has stated that she wishes to play the character for as long as she can, and this definitely provides an avenue for it. Nick Fury at this point is of course adrift in space with the Skrulls, so who knows, they may even end up crossing paths. On Earth, Coulson opens up the briefcase and finds a car key which he tracks to Lola, Coulson's old ride. Coulson starts it up and it then transforms from red to black. This was something that was in the comics, and Nick Fury himself actually did it at one point, choosing black, much like how Coulson does here. We see Coulson fly off, and the Triskelion in the background. Though it was destroyed in the Winter Soldier, it's back here showing that S.H.I.E.L.D. was rebuilt, and that the agency still exists out there, even if we won't be following the overall stories of the characters. Now what this could also answer is whether the show is actually connected to the MCU or not. At this point in the timeline, the snap has been carried out, and half of all life has been wiped out. However, the world we see is fruitful and vibrant, so they may exist in a timeline in which Thanos did not win. Who knows, it could even be a continuation of the 2014 one in which that version of Thanos was killed at the end of Endgame. I kinda don't wanna sour the ending by talking about whether it was connected or not though because, you know what, it's been a great series and it doesn't really matter, you can kind of take it how you want to. Overall, this was an excellent way to end it in my opinion, and watching our favourite characters ride off into the sunset, or rather sun, was an excellent way to bring S.H.I.E.L.D. to a close. Now there are lots of avenues that Marvel can take things if they want to, but if they don't, this was still a great way to end the series. Anyway, that's the entire season, 
And I'd obviously love to hear your thoughts on the show as a whole, like what you've loved, what you've disliked, and how you think the show will be remembered. Comment below and let me know, and if you enjoyed this video, then please drop a thumbs up, and if you missed our analysis of any of the other episodes, then make sure you check them out after this. We will be covering Lovecraft Country from next week, and The Boys in September, so make sure you stick around for breakdowns on those. Don't forget that every month on the 15th we give away free Blu-rays and all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning the MCU Infinity Saga box set is leave a like and subscribe with notifications on. If you want to support the channel and get to see content early, then please consider clicking the join button below. You can also come chat to us on our Discord server, linked in the description, or heavy spoilers on Twitter. Thanks for making it until the end of the video. You've been the best, I've been Definition, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.